Um, all right, so everyone, we've made it. Um, this is the last session of a two-day conference, and I really appreciate you all being here this afternoon for what I think is the best session of the conference. Um, the last two days have been really full. We've, um, we've navigated this giant conference center, so you've found your way around, you've gotten on a lot of steps. Um, we've absorbed a lot of data and information and complex theories and new ideas, and we've networked with new friends and reconnected with old colleagues, um, and we've done some great thinking. We've checked a lot of assumptions that we've had about um, what we know and what we think related to public health, and we've done a lot of reflecting around our communities. And so I would say it sounds like the typical day of an elected official. Um, lots of information, lots of digesting complex information every day, and while it's tempting to think about your travel plans or what you're going to have for dinner this evening, um, I hope that you can be really present while we have this wonderful opportunity to engage with our elected officials today. So I'm very honored. I'm going to be doing some very brief introductions because most of you know who these people are. And then we'll get into some great discussion and content. So let's start with to my immediate left. Um, we have Chief Donald Ivey. Um, he has been the Coquille Indian um, Reserve. Indian Tribal Council Chief since 2014 and is well respected for promoting wellness in Indian country. Um, he specifically has worked on worksite wellness, breastfeeding policies, and has had an emphasis on traditional foods and strong alcohol and prevention programs and policies. Next to him, we have State Senator Elizabeth Siner Hayward. Um, she co-sponsored uh, the Tobacco 21 policy, which passed last year, yay, and represents one of the most um, metropolitan areas in the state, Senate District 17, which is Northwest Portland and Beaverton. Um, she's a family medicine doctor at OHSU and brings a great health care provider perspective to public health and serves on the House Health Care Committee currently. Next to Senator Steiner Hayward, we have Representative Rich Weil, who also co-sponsored Tobacco 21 last year, so we're very thankful for that. Yay. He is a small business owner and attorney, represents a slightly more rural area of the Portland metro um, area uh, with Sherwood and parts of Wilsonville, serves on house health care, and also is the vice chair of the Transportation Policy Committee. So welcome, Rep uh, Senator Representative Weil. Um, and then we have our two county commissioners. So to Representative Viles' left, we have uh, Zan Ogeru from Benton County. Um, Zan has championed work around land use, including the Albany to Corvallis multimodal um, project and has a strong focus on bringing collaborative problem solving skills to complex issues in Benton County. So welcome. And then at the end there, we have Deschutes County Commissioner Chair um, Tammy Bainey who has championed policies for a variety of uh, healthy community initiatives for many years and currently serves as the chair of the Oregon Transportation Commission, chair of the Central Oregon Health Council, and is active in um, thinking about policies to modernize the behavioral health and public health system. So welcome and thank you to our elected officials. All right, so we know that my microphone works, and we're going to test out these microphones. So before we get into the deep questions, I would love to hear from you all. Um, what is your favorite part about the community that you represent? Just a, a sentence or two um, so we can test out these microphones to make sure that they work. <coughs> we can start with whoever. Go ahead. I'm going to stand right You here. want to stand here? All right, <laughs> go for it. I want to stand here because I can't see half of you oh, no. <laughs> from here. Uh, the favorite thing about my community, the favorite thing that, uh, that I think brings us together as a community is not unlike the circumstances of this gathering over the last two days, where we have a place to come to that is arguably neutral ground. It doesn't belong to any of us. It's someone else's space that we're allowed and privileged to use. And we come together with shared purpose. We come together with shared expectations, quite frankly. Our expectations might be different, but the truth of the matter is, is that we do, in fact, have an expectation, some inspiration that brings us here. And what makes it successful is the fact that we have the opportunity to commune with each other, break bread together, to share food, to share our company, to share our thoughts, share our ideas. And we have the opportunity to gather as community. 
For the Coquille Indian tribe, there is a place for us. It's called the Community Plank House, built in a traditional fashion, many times bigger than a traditional house would be if my ancestors lived in. But it is one of those places of neutral ground. It is a place that we come to that belongs to all of us. It is the community's plank house, and the community is responsible to take care of that plank house. And so part of that responsibility is for us to come together as potlatch people to share with each other and to care for each other, but to be responsible to each other. And so I thank the organizers of this event. I thank the panelists for the opportunity and the privilege that it is for me to be here to represent my tribe, to represent in some way the nine federally recognized tribes in Oregon, and to share with you as a politician, as an elected leader in my community, that our concerns as politicians are your concerns as the program people that we depend on, we look to, and we appreciate to do the good work that there is to do and to do the good work that's already been done. Thank you. Thank you. All right, other favorite things about community. That was wonderful. Everyone can just do ditto to that, right? Um, I'll take a somewhat more prosaic response <laughs> approach. I think one of the things I love about my community is how diverse it is in a lot of different ways. We have really heavy industries, one of the world's largest manufacturers of marine barges. And if you know what a marine barge is? One of those things you see on the coast that's a mile behind a tug that's pulling it. Those are, a lot of those are made in my district. And then we have really high level stuff like Nike and Columbia, which are some of the world's leading manufacturers of sportswear and their design and innovation is pretty amazing, very high tech. We have a lot of creative um, industry, soft, small software companies, um, creative arts. Wyden and Kennedy is in my district, the big advertising firm. On the people side, um, we have some of the richest census tracts in the state, and we have a lot of Title I schools where we have a lot of kids on free or reduced lunch. We have, um, I think we're still plurality Caucasian, but we have a very large Latino population. The state's biggest mosque is literally almost across the street from my district. So we have a large Muslim community, which I really value. Um, there's a lot of individual personal div diversity in my district, too. So I value the richness of my district from, in terms of all the different business and individual and community perspectives that it brings to my work. Still even have some small family farms. <laughs> I feel really lucky to have been in my community for uh, just under 40 years now. And living in the community of Shoals, which is right in the middle of House District 26, House District 26 runs from South Hillsboro down through the Tualatin Valley, Shoals, Sherwood, then includes all of Wilsonville north of the Willamette River. It's the fastest growing um, house district in the state. All four of the metro urban growth boundary uh, extension applications happen to be in my district, and we're adding hundreds of houses a month to the population. As um, my colleague, Senator, Steiner Hayward said, it's the most diverse county in the state. It is the healthiest county in the state. And it's actually the most economically diverse and the most economically successful county in the entire state. I don't think those are something that is a matter of circumstance. I think those are things that really do work together. And so I'm really excited about being in my particular community. OK, uh, Benton County. Uh, I have been a, a county commissioner in Benton County for two years now. So I'm the, the newcomer on the block. And I, what I would say about Benton County is that it's um, a wonderful place to be an elected official because everyone is so incredibly engaged in what we do. Uh, that's true at the city level, if you're in Corvallis or in uh, Philomath, um, Adair Village, or Monroe, but it's also true at the county level. Uh, we have, we're home to Oregon State University. We have a large and vibrant school district, Samaritan Health Services, EPA, um, a couple of state um, fish and wildlife labs, and all of that together means that we have a highly educated public, uh, and they all know what's right and they all know what we should do. So it makes for a very lively uh, public engagement and uh, a 
a, a place where we have to really work hard to make sure that all voices are heard and that it's not always the usual voices that are heard, that we go out of our way to reach into the corners of the community where folks don't necessarily speak up, but they are very heavily impacted by our policies and practices and uh, make sure that we uh, hear their voices and don't have um, a set of unintended consequences of our aspirational policies. And my name is Tammy Bainey, and I'm a Deschutes County Commissioner, and I've been serving for the past 12 years, and I represent Bend, Redmond, Sisters, and Lapine. Bend is one of the fastest growing communities in the state of Oregon as well, and so what I love about our region is that um, we are a can-do sort of group, and we do a lot with our um, regional partners in Crook and Jefferson County, and we really don't um, see the lines as that distinct in terms of when you're from Deschutes or Crook or Jefferson. We really want to see how we can serve people as a population and um, serve their needs instead of just serving within those confines of a boundary. Um, we as, have an entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, we went from logging to logger, so we do a lot of uh, brewing. We have hum kombucha. We uh, really are trying to diversify our economy and uh, celebrate our uniqueness in terms of we are the second largest um, rural, um, Deschutes County holds the second largest rural population, which many wouldn't think of. Um, and the difference between a Lapine and a Bend and a Redmond and a Sisters is vastly different. But uh, what I love so much about our community is that um, they're willing to get involved and get engaged and uh, do what it takes to make sure that our community is healthy and economically viable. Great, thank you. I'm back here now. Hi, um, if you can't see me. So I heard a lot about in your uh, introductions about the places in your communities that you really appreciate and like. And the title of this conference, if you can tell, is Place Matters. And we've been discussing the past two days around um, policy solutions to address the top preventable um, causes of death in the state. So tobacco use, excessive alcohol use, uh, poor nutrition, and lack of physical activity. So thinking about your communities and the social and cultural factors that influence um, those preventable causes of death and uh, the places that people live, work, and play. I would, I would like to just hear from you all sort of a reflection on how place impacts health and if there's any um, examples of success stories that you could share um, in your communities related to those issues. And we'll start with um, Chief Ivy. This is my microphone test. <laughs> Can you see? I, I, thank you, by yeah, the way. There I, we go. I, welcome. <laughs> I'm just it's, hiding It's good to see you all. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that it's so much uh, a place sometimes uh, as it is <clears throat> the processes that occur as a result of place. But that being said, uh, if we're looking to uh, what comes to my mind is uh, the Coquitlam Indian Tribe operates with a health advisory board, which is kind of a, is the, the liaison between the legislative body that the tribal council is uh, and the programmatic departmental uh, health department, health and human services, uh, education program, and a lot of other sorts of things. And that health advisory board's job is to think about things in the largest context possible. So part of what its job is, advisory board's job is appointed by the tribal council is to test the thinking about health plans, health ideas, programs that we're thinking about initiating or programs that we need to report on uh, and test those against as broad a spectrum of the community as possible. So as an example, the health advisory board in entertaining its tobacco policies, the tobacco policies that were being promoted by the health department and some funding that comes along with that. <clears throat> the question is, is what's the relationship of tobacco to uh, Indian people, indigenous people, uh, tribes in the Pacific Northwest or in the United States or indigenous people around the world? And there is a cultural piece to tobacco. Uh, and so one of the things that we had to do was to think about, all right, we're going to, we're going to adopt a, uh, a tobacco policy that discourages the consumption of tobacco. But how do we do that in a way that doesn't contradict or compromise or confuse what might be for some people the traditional uses of tobacco? Whether that's commercial tobacco in a bag or in a stick, 
is less the point than it is a non-commercial use of what is a commercial product. So how do we reconcile? How do we figure that out? Um, and is that something that should happen in the health department at the conference uh, table? Or should we go up to the Plank House and maybe talk about this? But nonetheless, the people doing the talking were not the, 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 the staff people of the department. They weren't the elected politicians and administration staff of, the, of tribal government. It was this co pe collection of community people with experience uh, in the medical field and others to engage a conversation with the culture committee, with the elders committee, with the housing authority Kilkitch residence community, uh, with the administration of our housing authority, sit down and have a chat with the police department about this whole thing. Uh, talk to the folks at the community center who are educating our Head Start other kids to come up with what became really was not a tobacco policy per se. It was the cultural use of tobacco, the traditional use of tobacco that became the focus of the conversation. Yes, we needed to dismiss ourselves from this commercial tobacco question. We need to define that in a way so that we're not confused, even if we're talking about the same product, that we're not talking about the same purpose, not the same intent. So I guess in terms of the, trying to answer the question, yeah, place is important. We have to get together like this in neutral ground. We need to talk about these things. But if the place allows us, as I think a speaker said this morning, to ask the question, who else should be in this conversation? Who else needs to be here? Do we have room for those people? Have we invited those folks? And that's what our health advisory board does, is it invites those others of our community to engage the conversation. And I think that's important for us to be doing, but it's important too that it happens in place and that it happens about more than just the specifics of a particular policy question. But how do we, and we've got a lot of jargon words that get used in this conference today, frame things and this and that. And so there's lots of words we can use, but to have the conversation, engage it in the broadest sense, to have some opportunity for a third party, if you will, in neutral space, if you can. Great. It's good stuff. Thank you so much. <laughs> and thinking about uh, that great tobacco success you had in your community, and you heard some applause around um, Tobacco 21 policy that had passed last year. I'm wondering if uh, Representative Vile and Senator Steiner Hayward, if you wanted to share your experiences around what facilitated the success of that policy at a statewide level from your perspectives. I um, have to make a confession to you. <laughs> I'm, I currently still serve as the Washington County Planning Commission Chairman, and I practiced real estate law for uh, 35 plus years. I got to the legislature and folks, I didn't know the difference between Medicaid and Medicare. <laughs> I, I literally didn't. Um, I feel so fortunate that I was asked to consider uh, sponsoring T21 and everything I learned through that experience. My only observation would be this. I am tremendously disturbed by the partisanship that we're beset by nationally and even to some extent locally right now. And it's the kind of issue, tobacco usage, is the kind of issue that just absolutely should not have any partisan element to it whatsoever. But, Thank you. <laughs> but the reality is we are now in a place where in order to maintain sides, regardless of what the real policy issue is, we take sides. And so I guess the only thing I would like to say about my experience there is that it was not easy to be a Republican sponsoring that bill as a deer in the headlights freshman legislator. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm grateful that I had the mentorship of Senator Steiner Hayward through that process. But please understand that when we really make things so partisan, it makes it difficult for us to, to get things like that done. And it wasn't easy to, to get across the finish line with that particular bill. 
Um, so I want to start by echoing a lot of what Representative Vile said and thank him for being willing to take on something so ambitious in his first session. I don't know a lot of other freshmen who would have been willing to do that, and it's a testament to his commitment on what, to what's best for the state and not just thinking about party first. I'm really happy, by the way, that we have young people here. I just want to be clear about that. I think it's awesome. Um, so the thing, a couple things I would say about that bill. The first is that bill would not have succeeded without an incredibly strong coalition behind it. Right? I mean, people like Representative Vile and myself are figureheads a lot of the time. Doesn't mean we didn't work our tails off to get it across the finish line. We did. But we did it because we knew that we had an enormous team of people who had been working for a long time to build a coalition behind us. And I think a lot of the most successful, <coughs> excuse me, legislation of any kind, um, of, really, of real significance, but certainly big public health legislation like this comes from that kind of coalition building. Um, I had county commissioners that I had recruited to the cause, and AOC was incredibly supportive of this, um, thanks to the work of Commissioner Hall and Commissioner Doherty and Commissioner Minty Morris. And it was not an urban-rural thing. I mean, Commissioner Doherty is from Morrow County. Commissioner Minty Morris is from Klamath County. We had two of the three Klamath County commissioners come up and testify on this. So in that case, it was not a partisan issue at all. Um, so I think coalitions are really, really important. Um, figuring out what the likely opposition is going to be and how do you get around that early. So for example, one of the biggest arguments against Tobacco 21 is, well, people can go into the military at 18, so if they can die for their country, why can't they smoke? Like, well, they can die for their country, but they can't have a beer either, so, um, or cannabis. So what am I missing here? And tobacco is more addictive than either of those. So. <laughs> <clears throat> One of the things we did early on was we engaged with the Oregon Military Department and we got letters of support from the Oregon Military Department um, and who saying, we think this is one of the biggest threats to military readiness ever, and the Pentagon says the same thing. So that was really helpful for some people, not everybody. At least we could say, look, the that military was, that, doesn't... That was the thing in our caucus, Elizabeth, that made yeah. the whole difference. That, yeah. that one thing yeah. was the one that Yeah, and so figuring out what the, the big argument is against it and going again, fi fixing it early makes a huge difference. But this was an enormous team effort, and um, I'm proud to have been the chief sponsor. I brought it for the first time in 15 to at least get the conversation started. I'm really proud of Oregon for getting it across the finish line in two sessions. That's pretty amazing for big stuff like this. And I'm grateful to colleagues in Hawaii and California for doing this. And by the way, we passed it third. Our governor just signed it fifth. So. Yeah. Well, thank you for your I leadership. I say we're in the top three. <laughs> we appreciate your, your leadership in that um, issue. So our commissioners down there, uh, Senator Steiner Hayward mentioned, um, you know, partnership with commissioners for state policy, um, but county government plays a really unique role in creating healthy communities in Oregon. You have a broad spectrum of responsibilities from public safety to parks to your county fairs. Um, and I'm wondering from your perspective with that uniqueness of that local role and oftentimes you're serving as boards of health, if you have any um, successes that you would like to share related to creating healthy communities um, from the county perspective. Well, unlike um, Representative Vile, in my two years I don't have a crowning achievement to point to <laughs> yet. Um, we will. Um, We'll see how that unfolds. What I'd like to talk a little bit about is uh, Benton County and how we work. Uh, we, several years ago, adopted a policy of health in all policies. So at the Board of Commissioners, we do look at everything we do from a health perspective, not in a real um, rigorous checklist kind of way at this point, although I think, um, personally, I would like to see us move a little bit uh, more in that direction in terms of having some sense of criteria. What does it mean to look at health in all policies? so that we don't miss things as we move forward. 
The other uh, policy direction that we are adopting is that we embarked upon a visioning and um, strategic planning exercise at the county level uh, two years back called Thriving Communities 2040. And through that process, we engaged uh, with our community in a whole variety of ways, from the county fair to um, Campeones de Salud, uh, a health event uh, for uh, the Latino community, to um, meetings with every single uh, group that we could think of around the community through a, a council that we'd put together for the purpose. And we came up with a set of core values. And one of the, uh, uh, based on all of the responses that we'd gotten to the questions we asked about what, where the community wanted to be in 2040, one of the key values that came out of that was uh, uh, the high premium placed on the natural environment and parks, outdoor spaces. And our health department staff has been working very actively um, with that information, uh, with our public works folks, with community development, uh, with our transportation planners, to make uh, that uh, uh, value be a good be reflected throughout everything that we do. So, as um, Rebecca mentioned, one of the things that we have been working on is a Corvallis to Albany uh, bikeway. Uh, we have had very grand ambitions about that, being an off-road path, uh, multimodal, uh, that could serve as an alternate transportation corridor between Corvallis and Albany, uh, non-motorized, uh, that could uh, be very welcoming for families as well as for avid cyclists. But we have had some significant challenges. Uh, we have not been able to figure out an appropriate route for that path. Uh, the railroad is not interested in working with us on that. Um, um, uh, bikeway, so it's probably going to be an on-road path, and it's taking a lot of effort to build the right coalition, the right team of people that will support um, that kind of infrastructure that will allow for alternative transportation, which is really big in Benton County. Um, so I, I would say that um, because of the fact that we are looking at long-term and health and equity and uh, natural resource stewardship as core values, uh, we really take place seriously and are focusing on trying to ensure that our places support health for everyone in the community. Great, thank That's you. Great. Yeah, go for it. Oh, go, sorry. No, I was gonna say go for it, Commissioner oh, Bainey. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I wanted to first just kind of set the table for if an individual wants to come in with a great idea, whether it's public health, behavioral health, or just in general, um, to the board. So yesterday, we had an update on the Solid Waste Advisory Committee. We reviewed a small district buyout. We approved the community investment grant requests, of which we had 16 of those. We approved the Coordinated Human Services Transportation Plan. We reviewed the Employee Benefit Dental Plan amendments. <laughs> Uh, we held a two-hour land use appeal hearing. We had deliberations on two additional land use cases. We had an executive session on pending litigation. Uh, we have a long list of those. And then we had an uh, executive session on a labor contract. We had an executive session on a real estate negotiation. And then we followed up the evening with another land use hearing until about 9.30 last night. And so when an individual comes to us with a great idea that how could we possibly A, not get it, or B, not want it, um, our minds are often on 800 other things. That is one day and a snapshot of what most days look like for us, whether it's working on housing or transportation or, or um, appointing individuals to committees. Uh, I think it's important to really recognize as you come before a board of commissioners or even if it's a city council or whatever it might be, um, help us to kind of level set and understand the issue because we may not have our minds in the right frame of mind to be able to embrace the greatness of which you are just about to <laughs> unleash on us. <laughs> so the, uh, the example that I want to use from Deschutes County, and uh, I think I, I very much appreciate Representative Vile's comments about um, the political dynamics right now. And in one of my comments later, I'll, I'll mention that you know boards change too. So being um, cognizant of that. Uh, a handful of years ago, we uh, went forward with making all of our county campuses tobacco-free. 
And as the owner and operator also of the Fair and Expo Center, that includes our annual Deschutes County Rodeo. And so, as you can imagine, the challenge of a rodeo without tobacco, I mean, that's milk without cookies, right? So, uh, it was not an easy task for all of the reasons that I think have been presented here today. It's, um, it's in the how, though. It's not necessarily the what. And so it was not only bringing us data, but it was helping us to also understand the story behind it and what it meant to stand and say that tobacco-free rodeos can happen and they can happen in our community and that we're truly making that uh, cultural shift against the uh, norms of what would naturally be considered an everyday occurrence of tobacco at a fairgrounds or tobacco use at a rodeo. And so there was a lot of patience from our public health team and walking us through that. It wasn't a one and done, make a presentation and you're out the door. Um, but they essentially held our hand and helped us through that to understand what that meant. And um, so if you go on the Deschutes County Fair and Expo Center website, it'll tell you not only for our facilities that those are tobacco free, but also our rodeo. It notes that in there as well. So, uh, and I think that's also helped us with sponsorships. Our hospital system uh, supports our fair and rodeo and so does uh, Providence Health Plan. So, um, that's the example I'd like to use, and not Great. easy, but it can happen. Yeah, not easy. That's thank cool. you so much. Yeah. So we have an opportunity. Yeah, thank you. Now for some audience questions. I will have a, a one last question for you all, but I wanted to open up and see if there are audience questions, and not all of you need to answer every question, um, but I think there might be some microphones. I see Shira. And Megan, is that Megan? <laughs> Walking around with microphones. So this is your opportunity to ask questions of your local elected officials here. <laughs> no questions? Mm -hmm. I can't see, so. <laughs> Woo! We got a oh, we got one question, all right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Hi, uh, my name's Christy Inskip. I'm from Wayne County. Um, this, is, this question is for uh, Senator Steiner Hayward and Representative Vial. So I was wondering what what you all would need from us, the public health professionals and from our community partners, what you would need from us to help pass a good, strong tobacco retail policy bill at the state level. Yeah, you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think I got this one. <laughs> Um, I'm going to be very blunt with you guys, um, which I'm known for, for better or for worse. I don't think we can at this point. I think that horse has left the barn. We had our last chance to do that in 2016. I told everybody then that if we didn't pass it in 2016, a lot of counties were going to go out there and pass them on their own, and they have, which is great. And. Um, I don't know that we can walk that back for a while. Um, I wish that were not the case. It ticks me off royally that we didn't pass it in 2016. And I think one of the challenges that we face, and I know this is going to be part of the question, but I'm going to, Rebecca's going to ask later, but I'm going to start now. <laughs> I think a lot of people let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And we had infighting in the coalition that was supporting it. Um, and. I had some of my worst moments in the legislature during that session dealing with that bill, to be very blunt with you. I don't see that coming up as a serious attempt anytime in the near future. And it's not that I don't want it, because I sure as heck do, because the only way we're really going to start doing a good job of controlling sales to people under 21 is with a strong statewide licensure policy. I don't know how we get there right now. I'm not sure the counties are going to support us in doing it. That may be too pessimistic. It's very rare for me to be pessimistic like that. But right now, about that one, I am. It, it is rare for <laughs> my colleague to be pessimistic, honestly. Um, she's been optimistic about things before that I thought, wow, she really shouldn't be that optimistic. <laughs> but I, I have to agree 100%. And Again, I hate to be harping on this concept, but this goes back to uh, somewhat partisanship. It, it really becomes, I don't know what it means to be a Republican anymore. 
And I'm finding more and more of my Democratic colleagues don't know what it means to be a Democrat anymore. And yet, when we get in policy engagement type of conversations, suddenly, if we're not saying this, we're not being a good whatever. Pick your, pick your letter. I agree that that horse has left the barn and right now we should be focusing on something that we can get done and that one's probably not one of them. So what are your, do you have any tips for how our change agents here can navigate partisanship and bringing together issues that you said tobacco issues should not be partisan issues but um, any thoughts around how we can bridge um, some of those political divides as, as public health professionals? I want to start by making a comment about partisanship about tobacco. I, I'm going to disagree or clarify my perspective at least a little bit on something Rich said. Um, I think that the issue with something like tobacco is the issue of independent choice and how much of a role government should play in people's lives versus the strong public health value of something like tobacco control policy. And although I don't agree that this is a place where government, I, I, well, let me start with the positives. I do think this is a place where government has a role where it is appropriate for the state to regulate this because it is in the best interest of the state as a whole from a whole variety of perspectives. And frankly, I think in the long term it's in the best interest of private businesses because of issues around health care costs and all that kind of stuff. But I think, it's, I think it is in the best interest. But I get philosophically the issue about smaller government, about government not intruding on people's personal lives. That's how I feel about choice issues, right? I mean, I don't care how anybody else feels. I'm just saying that's how I feel. That's an issue between a woman and her doctor. And I get that some people feel differently about that, too, for strong ideological reasons. So I think one of the challenges is thinking about how do we frame conversations in ways that represent, that, that recognize, acknowledge, and respect different ideologies about how we think about the role of government in individual people's lives, right? <clears throat> so one of the pieces of advice I would give is that think about multiple ways to frame your arguments and listen really, really hard to the concerns that people raise and try to dig really deep into those concerns so that you can think about ways to address that. Just like we thought about the issue around the military and address that issue up front, right? So if you can really listen to the people who are opposed and try to understand it and then come up with ways to either tweak the bill or the policy or whatever it is you're trying to do at a state or county or city level, tweak the ordinance in ways that reflect some respect for different opinions then you get 80% of the way there, which is a huge step in the right direction. So I think building coalitions is clearly important, but really understanding the perspective of people who oppose you and trying to address some of their concerns is an incredibly powerful way to move forward. Uh, <laughs> if I haven't told you lately I love you, I don't want you to forget, okay? <laughs> the, uh, I mean, you nailed it on the head. The, I, I'll tell you a quick story. I'm on the Judiciary Committee also in the House. Yesterday I spent three and a half hours with seven convicted murderers at Oregon State Correctional Institute. Seven convicted murderers, all of whom had committed their murder before they were 16 years old. We're looking at the issues around how we might manage um, criminal justice, and especially with juveniles. Until I spent enough time, and I went in actually praying <laughs> that I would see these people as people, but until I spent enough time to actually listen carefully to their story and understand their perspective, I'd, I'd heard the district attorney perspective, and frankly, I'm a law and order kind of person. So I'd heard all that perspective, but until I spent that time and got to the place where I saw each one of them as a person, 
I wasn't prepared to really begin getting to the core issues that might make a difference as we do some kind of criminal justice reform. Great. Thank you. The unfortunate thing about partisanship is sometimes it tells me, don't listen to her because she's a Democrat. And that is just dead wrong. And it's bothering me right now. I was just telling um, Senator Steiner Hayward, two years ago when I went to the door, uh, I didn't hear this. But even last night again, as I was knocking doors in my campaign, I heard, I voted for you two years ago, but I can't vote for a Republican again. I just can't do it because, well, it would send the wrong message. I can't support that knucklehead Trump. Well, they, and they don't use the word knucklehead. They use stronger words than that, <laughs> which, to which I absolutely agree. But guess what? I didn't get listened to because they prejudged me based on something that really should not matter in our conversations. I don't know what that has to do with anything, but I, I just had to throw <laughs> it in. Thank you so much. <laughs> other audience questions? Do I see any other hands? This is your opportunity to connect with a local elected official. I see a hand over here. I, I actually have a question about alcohol policies and, and um, alcohol taxes. And I know we've had a history throughout Oregon in terms of trying to increase taxes. And I just wonder about what kind of work can be done between the alcohol industry, the recreation industry, the hotel and restaurant industry, um, wine and beer and cider is an entire big thing in Oregon. And how can we all come together um, from those sides? And, and so I'm going to jump in here. We have heard a lot from our um, state uh, reps. I'm wondering if from the local level, too, if we have examples either from the tribal level or um, from the county level around alcohol policies, thoughts? From a policy perspective on the county level, um, we, to my knowledge, I, I can't think of what we've done just as a county specifically. But again, our coining of uh, logging to logger, uh, having Deschutes Brewery and a variety of other um, breweries. We have Atlas Cider. We, um, we love our spirits as well. Um, we were doing things like pub crawls and ale trails and go to X number of breweries and get stamps, which also equates to pub crawl home, essentially. Um, and we started to incentivize the designated drivers and so that they can have their own. So Visit Ben now has their own stamp book for individuals that are the designated drivers that are making sure that individuals are getting a safe ride home. Um, that's a small um, lean-in to something that we are concerned about, which are our increase in DYIs. And, uh, but we also want to cultivate um, that entrepreneurial spirit and be able to keep those businesses uh, viable, too. So there's a sweet spot there in the middle of being able to recognize a community um, change that's happening and also find a way that you are embracing that change in a way that's healthy. Um, they, a lot of those uh, businesses also support prevention efforts. They do a lot with our nonprofits. Um, but I think that we could be doing more in terms of um, not highlighting so much the point of alcohol consumption, but the getting out, enjoying community, and other ways that you can do that. Uh, but for our, for our community in general, one of our, um, I mean, that's just, that is something that we have as our, um, that's in our fabric of, of businesses around spirits and around alcohol, um, that we are struggling to try and find that mix in the middle. Um, but that's just one example of how we're recognizing that and thinking, trying to think differently. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. This is a really complex question, and I don't know exactly what policy levers the county has uh, tried to engage in the past. Uh, I was uh, attended a session this morning uh, that made me think about our licensing criteria for um, serving alcohol, for instance, for, for folks uh, in the county outside of uh, the incorporated cities. Um, 
I would like to go back home and check on those criteria. I don't know what we can take into account uh, when we um, issue a license these days. But I, I, like Deschutes County, we are also, as part of our economic development strategy, focusing on the food and beverage cluster. We have two town cider, we have um, a lot of local breweries, we have several distilleries in the county, um, and it, it's something that it, it is a little bit unsettling, frankly, uh, because I feel like we are increasingly celebrating an alcohol culture, uh, and coming together is around booze. Um, with a major university in Benton County, uh, it's a real issue. Um, and I would say that in some ways, because of that, we are a little bit ahead in terms of our um, promotion of sobriety because we have such a large student population. And even the reader boards on the street these days ask you about mm -hmm. what you're doing at the next party and making sure that you're not um, sending your friends home drunk. So um, I, it's a team effort. It's got to be something that, that everyone from the community buys into, and you have to build those coalitions around whatever you do. But I think that we have a lot more work to do in this arena. Thank I you. I wanted to note one other yeah. thing. We are seeing cannabis tours. And I mean, obviously, you're not consuming, um, allegedly. Uh, <laughs> But I think that's something for us also to be looking at in terms of policy. And um, so that with the alcohol industry um, is not a recipe for success. And so local government, most of um, the growth uh, businesses and such are within the incorporated areas in Deschutes County. Um, but that is a, uh, a bit of a collusion of individuals. Um, we have Oregon and a variety of other businesses that are statewide wanting to really elevate uh, the marijuana industry too um, with what I consider uh, candidly to be a little bit of a ready fire aim in terms of policy and support. So um, in, in addition to the alcohol challenges that we have, we have those as well. Great. I, I heard a lament in your question about the need for additional revenue in the state. And I, th I think it's kind of incumbent upon me as the um, quote unquote conservative to, to make this observation. I would really like to see us have a much more stable revenue stream. And any thoughtful legislator knows that money is the, is the glue that helps us keep a successful society going. We can't do it without taxes. But the reality is this. We could all say Measure 97 failed because of this or that. Here is the absolute reality. Most people, I would say not including this room for the most part, or those who work in public sectors for the most part, but nevertheless, most people <coughs> do not see us as stewards of the public money being very effective. And because they don't trust us with the money that we've been given so far, they're reluctant to give us more. I think we've got to do a better job of showing our neighbors that we are willing to maybe work a little harder, maybe work a little smarter, maybe work a little more efficiently in using public money before we can realistically go ask for more. Now, can we change the revenue streams? Is there a, a, a path to sales tax versus income tax at some point? Maybe. But folks, I really don't think we're going to get there until we change that perception of our inefficiencies. Thank you. Megan, do you have a question over there? Yeah. Oh, OK. Um, so my question is for uh, primarily Chief Ivy, Jolene Estimo-Pitt from the Let's Talk Diversity <laughs> Coalition in Jefferson County, Oregon, uh, and the rest of the panel as well, if you have any insight, I'd love to hear it, is um, we um, were involved in the health equity coalitions you know, throughout the state of Oregon, and um, from what we've seen, uh, there's kind of a lack of involvement by the tribes in, in those coalitions. So in this conference, fortunately, I heard of another group. They're not involved with that, but they are involved in health, which was great to find out. 
So um, my question is, how would you recommend uh, tribes engage in these uh, coalitions and um, kind of public health at a local level and for specifically for uh, some of the tribes, um, you know, not feeling like they're eroding their tribal sovereignty by engaging, you know, at a kind of a county level. That's been a concern and a, you know, uh, on the tribe side. So if you have any insight, we'd, I'd love to hear it. I do not. But since we're at the table telling the truth today, <laughs> one of the challenges for tribes, uh, and for those of you in the room who, uh, through whatever the processes or coalitions or whatever they may be, who work directly with tribes, would appreciate <clears throat> is the tension that exists between tribes as a government within the state of Oregon. Uh, there was an executive order and now it's SB 770 that establishes that there's a government to government relationship between the tribes and the agencies of the state of Oregon, all of them, <clears throat> and the governor's office and the governor's executive staff and the legislature, the Commission of Indian Services. The list goes on and on and on. <clears throat> Excuse me. But the tension is that there are times when that government to government relationship is not, and here again, to use jargon words, it's not equal. There's not equity. There's not parity. There's not a bunch of things going on in that conversation. And tribes are reluctant to send their elected officials to a meeting when they're confronted with department heads, when they're not confronted with the agency directors themselves, but people who are, for lack of a better term, line managers. So the question becomes is not what is there to talk about, but how do we get the right people in the room to have that conversation? The government to government process, SB 770, still has been working now for 20, 20 plus years to accomplish that. Uh, and even if you look around this room and you look around the two days that you've been here, uh, the question becomes is how do we it's not that the conversation isn't worthy of having. It's not that the coalition, the collaboration, isn't worth the effort. But equalizing the talent, equalizing the authorities, equalizing the decision making on both sides of the table, when that's not in balance, that's part of the challenge for the tribes, quite frankly. Uh, and I'll just leave that at that, except I want to take off on a different point to the question about how do we generate revenue, those sorts of things. One of the tensions that we have within the state, now whether you're an Indian tribe managing a casino and a hotel, whether you're a member of uh, the Oregon Restaurant and Lodging Association and you're running an outfit somewhere, whatever, the state makes a tremendous amount of money from gaming. And so how we think about that, we think about, well, it's Indian casinos and it's Indian gaming, and we forget that the state is the biggest gamer in the state. And then we think about how do we take care of some of our alcohol problems, and you realize that the largest purveyor in the state of alcohol, distilled spirits, is the state of Oregon, OLCC. Those liquor stores are proprietors. The inventory belongs to the state. So when we think about tobacco, we think about, well, what, is the, what revenue is generated from tobacco tax? And we start to think about all these sorts of things, and so we end up not unlike the question here of how do we get health people and tribal people to sit down together and talk, how do we find the common ground between what is the need of the state and you and I as citizens for the services we receive and the revenues necessary to re receive those services, how do we find balance in the conversation when on one hand what we're wanting to do is regulate the one thing that pays us enough money so that we can regulate the thing that we don't want to do? And so that becomes part of our challenge as governments at the local level, uh, at the tribal level, state level, and the federal systems as well, uh, is trying to find not only a place to talk and something to talk about, but trying to find some balance in that conversation that's fairly represented, equitably represented, by all the interested parties. And that's all I'll say. Thank you. 
All right, so we are getting close to the end of our time together, and I do have one final question for the panelists. So we've had this conference four times now? Five times? Four times. Every two years. Um, we'll likely have another conference in October of 2020. So when you're invited back here to join us, what would you like us to be talking about? What do you hope that we'll be talking about at our Place Matters Public Health Conference in two years in Oregon? Ooh. I Anyone would really start? like us to not be talking about partisanship. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Other closing thoughts, yeah. So um, I hope that we're going to be talking about the progress we've made with public health modernization and the implementation of that. <clears throat> and I want to take a point of personal privilege. I see my dear friend and colleague, Representative Greenlick, and his amazing wife, Harriet, sitting over there. I don't know if Senator Monis Anderson has gotten here yet. Um, I have been extraordinarily privileged It's hard when you acknowledge people who matter a lot to you. Um, I've been extraordinarily privileged to work with Mitch Greenlick for well over 20 years now. We're both OHSU faculty. And then now he was my state representative for um, six, 10 years before I became a legislator. And now he's my colleague in the legislature. Um, I cannot think of a better mentor or friend um, around public health issues, and we are extraordinarily fortunate in this state to have Mitch there. Working on Lori Monis Anderson's committee has been a privilege and a pleasure and continues to be, and I've learned so much from her, from her background as a public health nurse. Um, and between the two of them, you could not pick better champions of public health in this state. I consider myself incredibly fortunate to work with both of them and grateful for their friendship and their mentorship and everything that they've taught me in my time in the legislature. <clears throat> so I just want to take this personal privilege to thank them both um, publicly. I blame Mitch Greenlick for the fact that I now do know the difference between Medicare and <laughs> Medicaid. Um, I, I really do feel extremely fortunate to have been asked to serve on the uh, health care committee in the House. If there's one thing about this job that I love, it's how much I learn. And I haven't learned as much anywhere as I have on that committee. In answering the question of what I'd like to hear about next time we gathered in this particular environment, uh, another thing I'm really fortunate to have been asked to do was sit on the Universal Health Care Working Group this past uh, summer that we've been working for about eight months. That's a, that's a three hour a month meeting uh, er, starting early in the morning hearing about all sorts of issues. And the thing that has rested upon my soul in those conversations has been the incredible absurdity of the fact that as the richest nation in the world, with the best technology in the world, we're getting some of the worst results in the world around our health care. While spending the most money. While spending the most money. Yeah. And it strikes me that a big reason for that is that we've got lots of us with very, very well-meaning um, objectives not working very effectively together. I see the, the incredible number of good people who come to that meeting all with very clear ideas about what would make things better but unfortunately, we have not found the path yet to get them all on the same page. If we can make that much progress over the next whatever period of time it might be in listening to each other, and I think public health is one of the amazing places where that happens. Uh, my colleague Tammy Bainey down here sits now as the chair of the Oregon Transportation Commission. I think transportation is one of the biggest issues we have around public health. 
But once again, we're not talking to each other as we should. And so I'll, uh, I'll go away here today with a prayer in my heart that we'll make progress on that, um, that objective of being more collaborative in our conversations around these issues. This is why I like working with this dude. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, wonderful. I'd like to go further upstream in terms of the social determinants of health and say that I'd love to hear more about housing and about collaboration at the state level, um, the Oregon Community Housing Services, and at the local level. Um, I want to hear about a whole variety of partnerships to address housing instability um, and uh, as such an, in, in a core stress in the lives of our um, residents. In Benton County, we have the uh, highest in income inequality in the state and incredible problems in terms of affordability. It leads to a long commute distances um, and stressing our transportation system. Um, the housing question is something that we have to address. I think it probably also leads to more stress and anxiety and more drinking and smoking. Mm -hmm. We have to address housing. Yeah. Thank you. And I feel like this is the moment that you say, ditto. Uh, <laughs> uh, I will tell you that as chair of the Oregon Transportation Commission, I've taken great leeway in using that position to align some of the state initiatives that we've been working on. So uh, the policy advisor, Tina Edland, uh, is working with the policy advisor. She's OHA. I don't know if Tina's here. Um, but uh, And then Brendan Finn with transportation. We are looking at ways in which we impact each other. There are discussions that are happening with the um, director at uh, ODOT with Oregon Housing and Community Services. So some of those things, it's toe in the water, not a cannonball yet, but I do hope that um, as we're looking at transit-oriented development and we're looking at ways in which we improve lives, I mean, the Place Matters Conference, this is exactly where we should be talking about those great things that are happening. But I wanted to narrow in just a little bit on, and it is transportation related, um, we are outpacing last year in terms of the number of fatalities in Oregon. And, um, you know, the loss of one is too many. Uh, so I would love for us to be looking at, um, we spend seven times more in treating injuries and hospitalization and et cetera due to um, injuries that occur biking and walking than we do on the infrastructure that's necessary to keep our communities healthy and safe. And um, we know that children are in the 19, I think it was, it was a CDC number of 1969, students were 47.7% were walking or biking to school, and today that number's around 12%. Uh, as a parent, I can give you a variety of reasons why, um, that I, I wouldn't want my daughter on some of our streets and uh, biking or walking to school, um, and it's safety. It's not I'm worried about uh, violence, I'm worried about her getting to and fro. Um, so I think that if we were to focus in on transportation related fatalities and how we are improving our communities to reduce those numbers and working together with public health, I see it as a, as a public health crisis and um, something that uh, we should be leaning into around awareness and education too. All right, thank you. All right, everyone, give a hand for your dedicated elected officials.